Hello, everybody. Do I have an interesting guest for you today? I am looking forward to introducing to you a woman who has been training for the Olympics. She's had three near-death experiences. She works really hard on people as a rolfer. If you don't know what that is, stick around. She spent time in a monastery, the most interesting person I can imagine. But the reason I want her on the show is because she is now a practicing medium. We're going to talk about how she has just flowed through all of those life adventures and what the mediumship is doing for her and for her clients now. So with no further ado, I want to bring on and introduce you to my friend and former student, Tammy Anderson. Welcome to the show, Tammy. Thank you for inviting me, Suzanne. You are welcome. Now, everybody, you can tell within the first few seconds, Tammy has this peaceful energy like nobody I've ever known. And for an Aikido instructor, I want to ask her about that. You know, I think of martial arts as, you know, very vibrant, but you have this vibe that's very mellow. Have you always been like this? No, I actually have two sides, um, two sides to me. Um, I can uh, really um, bring on the power if I have to, but usually I'm, I, right now, most of my life now is very calm, very peaceful. Um, I live basically in a monastery in my own home, so it's quiet most of the time. And most of my practice with people um, is one-on-one, -on -one, so I'm not somebody who gets in front of big crowds. I'm usually one-on-one -on -one with people, when I'm working with people doing body work, uh, I'm it's almost like I'm in a trance state because I'm I'm connecting so much to their universe. So, um, yeah. Let's talk about the body work. We're going to go all over the place today, and ultimately ending up with mediumship. But I heard about rolfing, and I know that it's where you 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 go so deep in the tissues, you you kind of open up the fascia, the connective tissues, and get energy flowing. Is that a good description of it? It's a structural body work that was developed by Dr. Ida Rolf. And um, she originally taught it to osteopathic um, physicians, but then she found that they didn't have the time. You know, it didn't fit into the 20 minute treatments of modern medicine. So um, it got given to um, lay people who, it's an intensive study of structural body work. And, and my master's thesis was on how structure affects emotional function. So I tested depression levels uh, um, before and after, and there was significant, you know, it's just, if you change the posture, your breathing changes, you know, and it's hard to be, hard. To, it's easy to be depressed when you're here, but when you're, when you're breathing, when you're upright, um, your, your point of view is different. That's so interesting, Tammy, because I teach that in my workshops about the difference between sadness and joy, yeah. but it, I forgot to mention Tammy is also a psychotherapist, so she brings so many things to the plate. But I have to tell you that I had a rolfing session and it can be painful. I think I've had it twice. Painful. But I also remember giggling all of a sudden and then crying. So absolutely, it's, it does some emotional release. It's too bad it has this reputation because it depends on the rolfer. It depends on the person. Um, when I work with a person um, I work at their own level so it's and and there's a thread between the body work that I do the martial arts that I do and the mediumship they all have a blending and the thread is that you don't go in with your own agenda you enter when I was first in first started doing body work many many years ago one of my teachers said to have the audacity to put your hands on another person and to mess with their universe, um, you need a background in, you know, psychology, you need a background in anatomy, you need a background in spirituality, because you're touching into a universe of unique in all the world. And, and, and to, to have the, um, to have your own agenda. Now there is a recipe with Dr. Rolf's 10 series, 12 series. But, but I found over the years that meet the person where they're at. And the same is in the spirit world. You meet the person where they're at and you meet the client who's on the other end, whether they're in deep grief, you meet them where they're at. And the same with Aikido. I meet them where they're at. I don't take my own agenda into the into the engagement um, and really in any kind of engagement with, with the person. You're, you're 
after meeting them for the first time because we're not the same every day. Everybody changes. And so, oh, I when we, we, we consider that we say, oh, I know that person. We don't know that person. They're different from yesterday. You know, mm -hmm. I've been watching you change you for you know several years now and it's like amazing and i wouldn't assume that you're the same as you were yesterday because you're different you're you're growing everyone. yeah every yeah. one of us so yeah. um with structural integration i basically i i sink into the first layer and a lot of times the the patterns of imbalance are at the superficial layers and so you don't go deep for deep sake you know and you can cause a lot more disorganization and so if I had one word for Dr. Rolf's work, um, that's I've been a privilege to do it for almost 30 years now, is that um, if I had one word for it, it would be relationship. Mm -hmm. Because I'm looking for a relationship with earth. I'm looking for a relationship with the breath. I'm looking for a relationship between the feet and the pelvis and the spine. And I'm also um, uh, looking, when a person's on the table, I'm looking at how they're breathing and their receptiveness, because some people you touch into it and it's like, oh, oh don't go any further. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not going to push any further. It's, you know, and a big part of, and I think this is a parallel to mediumship as well, is that a big part of the series of Rolfing series is education. I spend the first half an hour to 45 minutes of the first session of the 10 series. It's a 10 session series. I spend the first hour just in educating the client that we're walking, that this is not allopathic medicine. You don't come in with a knee injury and say, you know, okay, I'm going to focus on that knee. I focus on what's going on in the whole universe, the structure that's not supporting that knee. And how can I get the body and the body's wisdom to support itself and, and into healing? And so I'm looking for creating an environment for healing to happen. And the same in mediumship, I'm looking to create an environment for healing to happen, for connection to happen. And it's not up to me. It, you know, I, 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 I have some tools that I can create an environment, but the rest is up to spirit. The rest is up to the connection I make with the client. And I think it's very important that people who get who come into the medium succession as a client know that they're part of it. It's not something you're just going to, it's kind of like, uh, you know, psychotherapy. You know, you don't come into a psychotherapist thinking that, you know, you're going to get fixed. Now you're coming in to to work at your own pace. There's no pressure, and and you explore, you discover at your own pace. And so, there's a thread that goes through all of it. There's an and the, one of the thread thread is allowing, allowing what happens and what arises in the moment. It's very gestalt. You know, one of my my emphasis in my therapy is gestalt therapy, and it's being in the moment, being present with what is now. And um, that's that is with the um, Aikido. It's with the physical therapy that I do or rolfing. And because I'm not just in a rolfer, I got a really big background. I'm not the average rolfer as far as I went and supported my work with, you know, master's degree in kinesiology. And I mean, I spent many semesters doing gross anatomy. I took a part the brachial plexus, if you know what that is. That's all the nerves that go down from the neck into the arm. Um, I've dissected that. I had a whole semester where I had my own arm, and and the 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 the, the mystery, uh, the um, the not the mystery, the majesty, the um, incredible way we're made physically is in, is absolutely amazing. There's no no AI that's ever ever matched the physical form, um, that's developed that we've developed uh, in our body. So it's. It's amazing. So I can go on in many different directions. I don't know which direction you want me to go. Oh, well, I, I always tune into my guides and say, where do we go? And they want to go back to uh, when you and I first met. I believe it was when I taught a class in California. Mm -hmm. You were in the mediumship class. Mm -hmm. And I remember you distinctly. It's a very quiet, but very interested. It's just, you have this huge heart and it just, you don't have to open your mouth. It just shows up. But I believe you were brand new to mediumship then, weren't you? I was. I've had mediumship experiences all my life. But um, basically how I found you, I was on, I somehow I came across your documentary. And mm. I listened to that in 2019. I came across Messages of Hope. Yeah. 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 And uh, 
I listened to that and I was like, wow, because to me, before that mediumship was something you'd find at a carnival or something. Uh oh. I didn't take it seriously because. And now you are one. <laughs> I, I can't believe. And uh, anyway, so I'll stay with that track. So I, I went um, and I signed up because I wanted to meet you. And uh, I was just fascinated by your experience. And uh, so I, I, I didn't um, take your classes with the intention of ever being a medium. That was never my intention. And it still to recently wasn't. Huh. It, it's always been about my own spiritual growth and how to become closer to spirit world. I mean, I spent, you know, most of my younger life, you know, in the religious communities, um, living in monasteries. And Yeah, I want to talk about that. That's another thing. I mean, you stay with us to the end, guys, because Tammy is one surprise after another. <laughs> so, but I want to say that it's mostly because of my curiosity and my, my you know, um, I've had the medium experiences or connection to spirit all my life. And so I didn't know what to do with that. And so I went into uh, community life um, and spiritual life because that was the closest thing I ever knew. I never knew there was such thing as real mediums out there practicing. It was not something I was aware of. Wow. And um, mm -hmm. come to find out, I was right near Arthur Family College when I was living in a you know, religious community in Suffolk, England for a year. Wow. Yeah. Arthur Finley College is where both of us ended up studying with the uh, British spiritualists who teach evidential mediumship. Yeah. So you were staying for a year in a, was it a monastery, a convent or what? It was a convent. Basically it was an ecumenical conference center and the emphasis was on um, um, ecumenism, bringing together all different forms of religion and common ground, finding common ground. And I went that year, um, I went to meet, uh, it was I don't know what year it was, but anyways, I lose track of time because there's so much that's happened in my life. But I was there, um, and I went to meet Mother Teresa and the Pope. Um, and there was a International Youth Day, and there was twenty thousand young people talking about what what their hope for and dreams were for a future of a of a better world. And uh, it was all different languages, and so. Um, yeah, it was quite amazing. To fit. We filled up Notre Dame um, with young wow. people sitting on the floor. You know, we just it was amazing. So I could I, I watched one other interview that you did. I think it was your first. So this may be your second yeah, interview. My second ever. I'm not much of a public <laughs> public person. So and I love that you're not out to you know just be on stage or anything. You just no. want to help people. But you're by listening to the other interview, it was interesting to me that you have just followed your heart, followed your spirit, and yeah. followed the great spirit. Yes, yes, yes. I follow my heart. Um when I feel it, I just go with it, you know? And that's what I felt with when I watched your interview. I mean, your your documentary, I just thought, I gotta meet you. <laughs> and I gotta, because your integrity, your your passion, that just like, um, it just struck me because- uh, I, Well, you I, share that. That's why, it, I mean, I can tell that from, from yeah. the start. I wanna talk later about your training. Uh, I know that the one thing I want to want everybody to know about you, Tammy, is how committed you are to mediumship. And I I can tell that you, you're that way with whatever you do. You just throw yourself into it. But uh, you've been honing your mediumship abilities through this wonderful program called Very Soul, verysoul.com. Yes. I have interviewed, done an interview about that with Sally Hawk on my podcast. Y'all can look that one up. But I was impressed that you're one of the mediums that, that works so hard on there that just is on there all the time, because it's true. The more you practice, the better you get. You want to comment on that? So I've been with Very Soul since they were um, a prototype or whatever they call it, beginning beginning of just a thought almost. And uh, Sally invited me to join them. And that was 21, um, 2021. And um I think that's when uh, things kind of took off because I I was taking classes and I was doing the practice. But when I started with Very Soul, I mean, I had the the access to do practices every day, and I just hit it hard. And by it was it was you know COVID had hit and my business was you know it went down. Yeah, you can't do one on one body work when. 
you yeah, can no, do no. Right? <laughs> and so so I, I said, okay, well, let's just go for this, you know. And uh, I want to go back to Arthur Finley College. Why did I, I, I actually did something which um, I, I was thinking about going to Arthur Finley College because you had talked about it. I go, where is this place? Because I caught it when you were talking about it. I was like, got my curiosity. And so I looked it up. <laughs> and then I said, well, it was July then. And in the middle of the summer, it's hot, hot here where I live. And I said, well, okay, well, Spirit World, if you want me to go to Arthur Finley College, I want to see a rainbow in the summertime. Huh? Oh. <laughs> it's not going to happen in the, a rainbow in the summertime. But I, but it was like, and I turned the computer on the next morning and this big rainbow went across my screen. Oh. <laughs> and, it was like, oh. and it was such a shock to me. I knew it was from them. And uh, this, and I, my jaw dropped. I was like, I guess I'm going to Arthur Finley College. <laughs> so okay. anyways, that's how I got to that direction. But going back to Very Soul, it, it um, allowed me to go at my own pace. And it allowed me to work as a, with practice. It allowed me to have feedback which was very constructive. I love, I love that, that you got feedback that was a little painful, but boy, you listened, you took it on board and you adjusted and then just kept on going. It's happened many times. Like I have to say, that's not the easiest practice. (laughs) I mean, it's it's like anything else, you know, you get on the mat and Aikido and um, you know, when you're first learning, you know, techniques, you're in your head and uh you're trying to figure out your left foot from your right foot, you know, when you're doing a technique. But eventually the goal is to let go, go with the flow, follow the path of least resistance, you know, and 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 and, and redirect and find the find the find the flow with with two, two becoming one, you know, it's a beautiful art. And um it's about harmony and love. And so the same thing with mediumship. You know, first I'm trying to find my right, right foot for my left foot, you know, and it's not easy because it, it is, there's, you know, a, a practice of letting go. And the same with martial arts, you have to let go. And the same with, with, the, with the body work, you know, the person laying on the table, there is a surrender that needs to happen. And I can feel- so For people who are new to this, what are you letting go of in mediumship? What am I letting go of? Anybody. Ah, anybody. Um well, I can just say what I'm letting go of, and it's different, it changes different from time to time. But letting go of, one of the things I found really challenging was um, uh, letting go of the outcome. You know, I, I have, you know, a bleeding heart that, you know, when somebody's suffering, I mean, for a while there, I was getting parent after parent after parent. Like, you know, at one time I was getting 20, and I, had, I think I had 20 in a row. She's talking about parents who have a child across the veil, which I went, ooh, because that's, you really want to help them. You can feel their pain. Uh, Yeah, it's tough. And so um, it was, you know, my, um, the empathy, you know, uh, and to wanting to give them that, what they wanted, which was connection with their child. And, um, you know, it was happening like, and I, they come on and I'd say, another child, another one. And, um, in fact, there's one, um, I'll tell on myself, a, a really rough session, but I learned from this. And it's the rough ones that you learn from. Amen. Oh, oh yeah. And and, I, it, and you know it's your calling when you get back in the saddle after the rough ones. Yeah. yeah. It, takes so, courage. it takes courage and guts to get back in it. And, um, uh, but anyway, so uh, this this mom came on and she really wanted to hear from her son. And immediately, um, I said, I have a son in spirit here. And is this your son? And she said, yes. And I said. Um, After you gave some evidence. Right. For those who are new to this. I'm just, I, I say that there was this, this how this went was uh, all I got was I have a son in spirit. And he's and he's telling me his brother is is I don't want to say the name just because the person might be saying. But it's, <laughs> let's say his name is Tom. He's saying he yeah, has a brother, Tom. Um. And then he went silent. He, and and I was wanting to give, you know, my my on my side, I was wanting to give her, and I could see the need there. And um and then I just apologized because I said, you know, this is not that's he just went, I, I don't hear anything else. I don't see anything else. He's giving me his brother's name and that's it. I know now what what was happening, but um 
What was happening? What was happening was he wanted her to focus on her bro- his, her other son and not so much on him. Mm. She wanted him to focus on, on the, the living brother. And that was his message. And that's all he had to say because she was she was really focusing on the son that had gone. Yes. And he, and his message was, I'm st- I'll still be here. I, I'm still here and I'll be here when you cross. But for now, focus on my brother because he needs you. And and that was the message. And if I would have just gone there, but I went into trying thinking I should have more. And that's all he wanted to share. Hmm. And so um uh I learned from that one. Let them share what they want to share. That. Yeah. Yeah. So as I stay with what they that's the evidence. You know, it was clear that that's what he wanted to share. So hmm. So I learned from that, don't go in with my own agenda. The same with Aikido. Don't try to take a person where they're not willing to go. Mm-hmm. Um, you 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 find a find a place of flow and go with that. Yeah. But it's so the- tell us tell us, Tammy, about how you have known the spirit world is real. What has your interaction with them been and from what age? Well, I think it started from day one because of the near death experiences that I had, you know, I mean, uh, born, uh, still born. So they, I wasn't breathing when uh, 38 hours of labor on my mom, she said, she didn't even say it was a girl or a boy because when I was delivered, they said it just didn't make it. Sorry. You know, oh. and um, they took me into another room and, uh, they finally, oh. they came out and said, uh, well, we got her going and she's, only three pounds something and we have to put her in a bubble and and you can't have her for six I think it was six or eight weeks they would come on the weekends and look through the window and but the interesting thing about that is I have memories and I remember these memories when I was 17 I went through healing and healing with um, a priest who was a healer that I became friend with and I remembered everything I remember the feelings and the emotions of my grandparents the feelings and emotions of my parents, all the, the nurses I, I could remember and I could feel their emotions. Um, mm-hmm. It was quite quite an amazing experience. And uh, to this day, I remember everything about uh, the conception. I remember the stress my mom was under um, as she was carrying me. I was aware of this. And so um, anyways, so that was the first near-death experience. And the second one was about six months later because I had to have a surgery as a child and um, because the fontanelles had closed and that's the soft spots in the head yeah. and so the head couldn't grow. And so I would have died anyways, probably, um, or been severely retarded. And so um, anyway, so my parents took the courage to have this surgery. Well, I was so tiny that they, when they did the anesthesia, the anesthesia uh, killed me. <laughs> so huh. I, went, I died then. And uh, they had to bring, had to do some stuff with my heart, came back with all kinds of holes in my heart, they said. And um, the apparently my mom has told me that the surgeon just shake his head and said, there's no reason why this kid should be alive. It just has a will to live. And I know now it's just the will of, of this, you know, right. life, life itself, spirit. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so... Um, I believe that these two incidences kind of set me in a direction to be connected somehow because I was always a bit um, in the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else you explain it, but uh, yeah. I've always, I tried to fit in by doing sports. So I was very athletic and 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 that's how I, the communication was easier for me that way. And, but I would hang out and I found early on that I would, I loved classical music. I would listen to, and I found early on that I would, I loved classical music. I would listen to the spaces in between and I'd find God there. The spaces in between and I'd find God there. Oh my. In the space in between. And so I was naturally a contemplative, naturally all my life. Um, I loved the quiet. How did you fit in as a teenager in school? Or did you? Uh, I fit in, but uh, I fitted in. I figured out how to fit in through my athletics. Okay. 
because uh, nobody would be understanding understand what I was feeling or, or so I didn't talk about it because people wouldn't understand. I didn't even talk to my own family because they wouldn't understand. What, what is it they wouldn't understand? A connection you felt or were you seeing spirits or what? I, I wasn't seeing spirits, but I was feeling them. Um, when we, my parents actually built a house on some property once and I could feel that there was a child that died there. Mm-hmm. And eventually we found out that that was true. There was a farmhouse there that burnt down and it was a child inside, a female little mm-hmm. girl. Mm-hmm. So, um, I've, I've had, I call it my unfortunate uh, ability because I've had the unfortunate ability. Um, I shouldn't call it that now because it's not probably, but precognitive. Um, so mm-hmm. I see things yeah. before. And particularly around death, I I know when people are passing. I've and met I can well, walk uh, a handful of people when people are. Yeah, yeah, I've met a handful of people who had who have that ability, and you call it an unfortunate ability. What do you do with that when that happens? You know, uh, it's been challenging because there's not much you can do. You know, I mean, it is what it is. And um, I found out that there's not much you can do. You're just tapping into what's coming. I knew that my brother was going to pass Mm. uh, several months before. I knew um, one of my mentors. I knew he was going to pass so much. So I've, I've, and it's really strange because I feel like I'm um, part of me is going with them. And, and so I feel like I'm preparing to pass because especially people close to me, because I feel like a part of me is going to be going with them, which it is, you know. Sure, the soul. Yeah. And so um, I knew I knew with my brother, I did tell my mother, I said several months before, I said, every time he turns around and I see his back, um, I get this feeling, this feeling in my stomach, like he's not coming back. And this was visceral, it was strong. And my mom got nervous because I've had intuitions all my life and she's like, what, you know, so she was trying to get him to get rid of the motorcycles. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but um, I knew it was going to happen. And um, the day, I don't know if you want to hear the story. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. So the the day he um, passed, he, he was getting ready to get on his motorcycle. He was 18 years old and he was getting ready to go on his motorcycle. And he said, uh, he didn't have his helmet. So I looked at him. I said, where's your helmet? You know, older sister. And um, he's five years younger than me. And uh, I was 23 at the time. And he goes, oh, okay. So he went back and get his helmet, put his helmet on and he had the visor up and he goes, goodbye. I love you. And it was like, bam, I felt like somebody punched me in the stomach and I couldn't say, I love you. I couldn't say nothing. I just stared at him. I was like, I was in a, like a daze. I couldn't, it's hard to explain what the feelings were. Well, we got in, I got in the car with my mom and dad to go out to lunch, but we stopped by where he had gone to his friend's house and they were all standing in the front. And I was looking, I remember looking out the window of the car and it was like, I was just looking like I was watching a movie that I couldn't, that I was just watching a movie that I couldn't stop anything that was gonna happen. And he was getting in the car with his best friend when he was 16 years old. And his friend's dad had um, given him a Porsche for his 16th birthday. And Porsches are hard to control. Anyways, they went driving in the mountains and lost control. My brother, uh, he was killed instantly. They hit a tree and uh, and he was gone. And and the unfortunate part of that day was when the phone rang, I looked at my mom and I said, Ron's dead. Mm. And you don't say that before people know because... I did, it just came out of me, but uh, um, they just, why would you say such a thing? You know? And they went into a full panic and it was a very rough day. So how do you explain all of that? I, you and I know, but for the audience, the, how do you explain the precognition and the fact that it was going to happen? What is your experience with that? Um, precognition, I can only think that um, all time, we're, we're, we, we, a part of us, part of me, is experiencing um, out of time. I I can experience life out of time. There is no time, and 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 so when I'm experiencing glimpses of that, um, everything's already happened. 
our lives have already happened, you know, or from and that, that brings into question free will. So why do we choose anything? Do we have free will? Uh, yes and no. Yeah. All right. The, the guys just said, don't go down that rabbit hole. So we're not going to. <laughs> it's a rough one to, yeah, to explain because, um, in fact, I asked this very question when I went um, in my third near death experience. Okay. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about that. And that was one of the questions I was asking is, uh, is there free will? And why do babies suffer? And why is there suffering? Okay, let's go there. Okay. okay. So the third near death experience was right before my brother died about two weeks. And I have had a habit from many years of going into the mountains and just fasting and doing the spiritual walk, uh, I call it. And I just go into the silence, go into the quiet of nature. 23 and, years and old. connect with, uh, with, wow. with God. Spirit. What's that? I said 23 years old. That's, that's very telling about your path. Yeah. yeah. And so I was in the mountains. I was fasting, maybe overdoing it. Probably. Yes. I was overdoing it, not drinking enough and not eating at all. It was very hot. And I just went out. Um, I was on the ground and I just went out. And I call it a near-death experience because that's all I know how to explain it. But um, my first um, realization in that experience is I was out of my body and I was going into the, the light, the tunnel that everybody talks about. And it was so full of love. It was just complete love and, and more than any words can even come close to. And I... There was many people going towards the light, many souls going towards the light. And um, the person in front of me, I realized it was my grandfather. And wow. my grandfather was a very quiet man and um, very reserved, very quiet. And he turned, he, I, he turned around and I, Papa, you know, and it was just like, I was filled with love. That, and I, the thing that I realized that, realize it's very different um here is that we communicate with our our mouths and there it's all telepathic but it's more than that it's not the mind it's it's a whole um whole experience of of this oneness you're you realize everything i mean no misunderstandings there because you feel everything and um so it was just an amazing experience to meet my grandfather He's the first one that in my life I experienced dying that was close to me. And uh, uh, it was just amazing. And so I asked him, I said, okay, so what's the real deal about Jesus? Oh. <laughs> and oh, <that's> great. <laughs> and because I heard about, you know, th there's so many stories about him. And I said, I want the real deal. Let me tell me about him. Have you met him? <laughs> and uh, as soon as I said that, I, I was looking into the eyes of Jesus. And uh, did I promise you surprises, everybody? This is, yeah. Okay. It was absolutely, um, I can't put words to the, to the love that I felt. And I was going into that love deeply. And um, I wished I could express even a, a, a tiny bit of how beautiful this experience was. And so what happened was um, I was going into that. There was no way I was going to turn around and go back out of that. And so, but some um, aspect, I can't say if it's a female or male, but pulled me to the side. And I'll just say female just for your communication. Um, easy to explain. It was this being, beautiful being pulled me to the side because I was, I was leaving, <laughs> you know. And um, I'll say she just because it's, there's a softness about this energy, really soft. And um, this gentleness pulled me to the side. And then I start asking questions. Why do people suffer? I want to know why. I want to know why, why babies, you know, that, you know, are barely even born come in and they're in abusive situations. I want to know why women are raped and killed. And I mean, I worked as a counselor in a rape center and a domestic violence. So, so um, I've worked with the homeless on the streets. So um, uh, I wanted to know why. And, uh, It was very interesting because as soon as I asked the question, I understood. But I understood on a whole being level, not just my mind. 
And I have to say that what I understood was everything was perfect. Everything was perfect. And um, all the suffering that we experience um, and the bigger picture is is for a reason and not not somebody is imposing on us but it's it's our it's our uh evolving it's our opening into into love and without out the even you know when i look at mediumship but without the tough things that have happened i wouldn't be experiencing the the um, flow that i'm experiencing today i don't take a lot of credit for that ex except that i um i just keep getting up you know um and going back into the fight but i can hear some people listening saying but but, but the baby that's suffering yeah. that's human view right you had the bigger wholeness view yeah. beyond that so it's the paradox isn't it of being yeah. both human and the wholeness at the same time and trusting the process yeah so the human part still can understand i mean i i still you know uh, it's still hard to see suffering um and and i still in those times i see remember remember <laughs> but i forget you know because it's i'm supposed to be experiencing all that's all that life this is not supposed to but i'm choosing my soul is choosing to experience these things and i realized after going out of my uh, body at that point um that i'm here for human being experience that it's not about going out of our body right now. We will, you know, soon enough. But I'm here for the full experience, and um, and and so jump all in, you know, experience all of it more as much as you can. And so I can say that the the human part of me still struggles with suffering. I don't want to see people suffer, um, but I have to say that you know the, the higher aspects of me understands that the per, there's perfection in all of this. And that love is all there is, <laughs> really. Dive back into that for those who are new to this and just can't grasp it, that it's it, it all has to do with the evolving towards love. These are all opportunities to give more love, to find the understanding, to help each other get to the point where we don't hurt each other. I love that what you're saying rings true with what my guides have been saying for for 14 years now that, you know, this is truth with a capital T and yet it's so challenging for our human intellect to grasp that. Yeah. But you've been around we many learn aspects of compassion that we couldn't otherwise understand. We learn aspects of empathy and, and generosity. Um, and we learn that we have choices. We can choose to turn away from the light and we can choose to turn into the light. And all that's okay. Choose. Choose. All right. Let's come back then after that near-death experience that started this whole conversation. Amazing stuff. You Were you seeing more, interacting more with the spirit world? Did you feel more connected? Age 23. Well, just the end of that experience was when I started asking these questions. I started getting... Um, I don't know what you would call it, but darts of light coming into me, different colors. And it was like each piece of light that was coming into me was understanding. Was this is after the near-death experience, you're going about your life? During the, the right at the end of that near-death experience. Oh, okay, okay. And so so I can periodically, I, I go back into that and I let the download come in and I tune into each piece of light that's coming. But it was just... It, ecstasy on top of ecstasy it was just like a feeling that you hard to describe but um so from that experience i i can i often tune back into that um experience and and i understand things um that help me help me do what i do wow have you ever seen a spirit objectively um once well actually twice but um, once was my brother and oh, he died. He was on my porch. He was standing on my porch. And, Did he get a message? Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> it was it was so jarring to me. And I was as open as I am to all this, I couldn't take it. 
<laughs> it was right after he died. And I said, I can't take this. So he came to me that evening when I was resting. What, excuse me a second. It wasn't the message. It was just seeing him that jarred you, right? Yeah. Okay. And so, but he was persistent. He came to me that evening when I was sleeping and it wasn't a dream. It was more than, <laughs> it was one of those where you remember every aspect of it. And he was laughing because I had shared with him the experience the few weeks before we had went out to lunch together and I shared with him my experience of meeting my grandfather and all this story I just told you. And he listened very um, quietly. We weren't brought up in a religious family, hmm. but he said with an innocence of a child, I, I believe in God. And um, it just, it, it had no, no theology, no dogma behind it. It was just pure. I know there's more. That's and when you shared before he had passed, right? Before he'd passed. Okay. Yeah. At, we were out to lunch and I was sharing my experience. Well, after, <laughs> after he, he came to me in, in that night um, and he, he was laughing, like all the things that you philosophize, you can't even imagine. You're not even, it's like the words that we say, it's, 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 they're not even close to the, to what it's like. But anyways, um, he, he said, you mean, well, you you mean, uh, what I understand you to say is that the reality where he was is just so much more, right? You can't even put it. That's what he, he said. He said, you're right about one thing. And I said, what? And he said, he said, there's more to it what appears to be. <laughs> and so whenever I think I know something, I go back to that because, you know, um, uh, we can't fit it in our human, our human brain, all this, the magnificence of the design and the perfection of the design. And so, um, yeah, we can, we can have our, our thoughts about what it's like, and, but nothing's going to come close it's it's there's always more to it than what appears to be and uh so what about those who are listening tammy who who are grieving the loss of a loved one we get an awful lot of shining light parents with children across the veil people whose spouses have siblings all relationships what i know what you experienced during your near-death experience but now as a working medium what can you tell those who are grieving right now well having watched my parents you know lose a, lose a child there is no greater pain and so i just want to start there there's no greater pain than losing a child um and so but i know absolutely um absolutely that love transcends death and that there really is no death it just this is a moment we're almost it feels like we're in a dream we're already there with them in a sense time we uh, there I, I believe that we are already there they're just an aspect of our consciousness that it's having this human experience um and so it doesn't end here <laughs> and um so but there's not really much that i can say to a grieving parent in that it's gonna hurt it's gonna hurt like and it's never gonna stop hurting it's gonna shift and change and the growth growth will happen and and uh um, but it hurts. It's uh, there's nothing like the loss of a child. But your guarantee and your awareness, that's that's what I love to share as well. You know, I, I say it often. I guarantee you, your loved ones are still with you now. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. even that, you know, to somebody. But um, I have to say that since I've been doing the mediumship, there's three people, three parents that have talked to me and said that they were considering suicide and didn't after that connection. And um, that makes it, yes, makes indeed, it worth all of it. That makes you you are now no longer a baby medium or a teenager medium, <laughs> an established medium. That's when, you know when you get to that point because that is one of the benefits of this sacred work that we do. You talked about not imagining yourself as a medium and thinking they were all charlatans, and now you're saving lives. It's yeah. the potential there. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, before we run out of time, you, you surprised me. You were, you know, training to be an Olympic athlete in flat water kayaking. And that I'm, I don't want to go there. I just want to say that you're just a, a woman of uh, wearing a coat of many colors here. You lived in a monastery with monks, with men. You forced your way in and said, I want to be here. And they let you in there. We didn't talk about that. An Aikido instructor. Uh, 
I don't know if you're even allowed to talk about your unusual home and what you did there, but what else would surprise me, not to mention everybody that's listening, about you as it relates to this whole spirituality and your mediumship or anything? Gosh, what else would surprise me? What comes to mind is um something that ties in with the mediumship and that and and maybe will help others, but um uh walking into the fear, walking into the, the presence with with love. Um and I do that with Aikido. Um I've had three you know two home invasions. Um, where I've had to, people ask me, have I ever used Aikido? And and um, Aikido is about um, hopefully harmonizing the situation so that that uh, that everyone will survive in the end. Um, so that's the second voice here. I heard. Was let's one. Stop just, let me stop. I want to hear about these home invasions and how you used it. But for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Aikido is a martial art. Now you a black, you've, you've, you've got to be a black belt or more or whatever if there's I'm more. a fifth, fifth degree black belt teacher um uh, I've been training over, over 40 about 40 years okay so oh, it's a martial art but based on love and harmony that's why you you sent me a book on it and yeah yeah that's right. I could read the philosophy is is it dovetails with mediumship about balance and harmony and me, like you say but tell so, us how you use that with two home invasions so the so the the um let me just talk about aikido for a second the the idea um it was it was a martial art based on battlefield techniques this was you know jujitsu daitoru jujitsu um some kendo stuff but it's it's sword practices but it was based in battlefield techniques after world war ii the the um I'm sorry, I had to laugh because you just gave me my sign that validated something that happened in meditation. I said, I need sword. And you just gave me sword. Well, but I, let, me, let me just tell you something really funny because I had a mother that asked for this this sign as well for her son. And I said, how, how I'm getting off my story now, but how is it possible that you connected with me, um, a medium who actually, <laughs> you know, I carry a sword right here. <laughs> You just did it. You just did it. <laughs> yeah. And so that was that was the sign. Um, and so you, you just claimed that sign again. I cannot but, believe you have it sitting there. I had not I thought, oh, I didn't want to just hear it. I was shown I want to see somebody hold a sword. I did not know Aikido was swords. Now that I think about it, I thought it was batons. Oh my god, I love it. And this was a big sign for me. So put that aside. Back to Tammy. <laughs> how many how do how many mediums carry a sword, right? So no. yeah, not not many. And and so anyway, so Aikido after World War II, the founder, you know, after what happened in Japan, you know, the bombs and everything, he said there's got to be a better way, you know, um, than injuring people. There has to be love. Has to be there has to be a pathway for love in the martial arts. And so um, he, he formed Aikido, which was a new art off of the uh, uh, jiu-jitsu um, line, um, off of Daitu dai uh, jiu-jitsu. Anyways, so uh, he had enlightenment experiences by just moving out of the way. And there was one story of a general that came at him with his sword and kept trying to you know, cut him down. And he just wasn't there. He just kept moving. And he, was, he, he wore the guy out. And he finally gave up. And he bowed to him and said, <laughs> So, um, so what I've what I've been looking for in my practice of Aikido, and I'm looking, I'm not there yet in the mediumship, but I'm looking for the stillness of this. And and there's a story of um, that I heard once about um, in in China, where the um, uh, the military was going in to to uh, Tibet, and they were killing the monks, they were disbowling them, just all kinds of really bad stuff in Tibet, and there was this most of the monks flee flee into the hills flew into the hills but there was one monk that stood in the courtyard and he just stood there and this general or commander whoever he was he walked he walked up to him and he drew his sword he pointed it at him and said don't you know who i am with one one cut i can cut you down without even blinking my eyes 
without even a blink, I could cut you down. And the monk said to him, don't you know who I am? You could cut me down with your sword and I will not blink an eye. So it's that stillness. It's that stillness that I'm looking for in my practice, whether it be Aikido, whether it be body work or whether it be mediumship. It's all my practice of finding that stillness. In fact, I could tell you a story where I did do that. I was in I was in France. Um, I was going to Taizé, which is you know this amazing place of uh, Brother Roger, who that's a whole nother story. But I was going on a journey, um, and I wasn't hitchhiking. I the bus had stopped, and I needed to go five more miles. I was walking, and this car stopped and said, "You want to ride?" And I said, "Okay." Well, I have five mile, more miles, so I put my backpack in the car. Well, he didn't turn off, and he kept going. And then it started getting dark. And then, oh. it, and I said, you missed the turn. <laughs> and 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 he and he, he said, no, 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 it's a shorter way this way. So in the now it was dark. It wasn't daytime anymore. We were turning off of a dirt road. He was going to get some privacy. He was driving down some trees. And I thought, I'm in trouble, <laughs> real in trouble. And you know how you watch the cartoons where the, the legs shake, you know, the knees knock. <laughs> That's what my body started doing. Everything started shaking that kind of fear and so and so you know he was still driving down the you know and I knew this was this is not going to be good and so I I just started praying and I said if this starts today one of us will die I will kill him or he will kill me there's not going to be a little middle way here it's going to be one of us will walk out of here alive today and as soon as I did that peace filled my body and a stillness beyond any, any I can express the stillness that came into me. And um, the power. And the reason is because I found this one of the secrets. <laughs> the secret is I have nothing to lose. I'm already dead. And that's the most dangerous person in the world to fool with at that moment. That's the monk standing there and goes, you could cut me through your sword and I won't blink an eye. So he somehow sensed that, right? He sensed it. It was like watching somebody die because all the color went out of him and all the fear went into his body. He started shaking. And I said, you start this car. Because at that time he st stopped the car. And I said, you start this car. You're going to take me to a hotel. And then in the morning, you're going to pick me up early. And you're going to take me to where you should take me to in the first place. And he said, okay. The next morning, he picked me up. He took me to Teze and he, he said, be careful out there before he let me out. The, you know, I, I was getting out the car. He said, be careful because it's dangerous out there. And I said, I handed him a Franciscan cross and I said, I'll see you again someday. And I know I will because he was a teacher. I learned from him the power of, of uh, surrender for letting go. Um, and fearing nothing because you can't kill somebody that's already surrendered into death. And so um, it's that stillness that I look for when I practice um, uh, Aikido. And it's that stillness that I look for when I practice mediumship. And it's that stillness that I hope to bring in people who are suffering and, and lost their balance, you know, and, and, and it's that quiet stillness that people say, yeah, I feel that you know, and they connect to that for a moment. And all that is is a remembering of who we really are, which is that still point between the spaces in between where words words can't meet you there. It's 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 a presence. And so um yeah, so that's that's that story. <laughs> that's the stillness I look for. I haven't got there yet actually in mediumship. I'm still learning. Um and and you're putting yourself out there day after day and helping people in the meantime. We're always still learning. We're all still learning. I'm learning from you tremendously. You're yeah. you're a beautiful teacher. Yeah, well, I feel like we're all teachers and we're all students and I'm continually learning. You know, I can get on the mat after 40 some years and feel like a beginner in a sense. It's finding that empty mind, that still mind, that no mind place where we just start to flow. I've had experiences in the dojo I hope to have this someday in mediumship where I was training a full blast with somebody. We're just bam, bam, bam with the sticks, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, I just, 
my consciousness went into 360 degrees and I was aware of everything around the building. I was aware of everything in the dojo. I was aware of his breath. I was aware of his feet. I was aware of my feet. I was aware of the bird drinking water in the stream outside. I was aware of everything. 360. It was unbelievable. I didn't try to do this. It just, it was a snap. I felt a snap and I was. Reality there. parted. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I was, I was in a state of consciousness where everything, I was everything and everything. I was aware of everything. And um, so, um, yeah, it's being in that flow. You know, Tammy, I'm, I'm tuning in as you're talking and I'm going to put myself on report because I think it's a, a good lesson for all of us. All right. Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, this story, but it, it <laughs> so I don't know what, what brought you into my awareness when we decided to do this show. I'm telling everybody, you know, the story already, but Lynette schedules my podcast normally. Yeah. And I have a, a a rule of myself, never say anything bad about anybody. And if you're going to say, it's just, just don't do it. Don't, you know, the thought may come to you, but don't say it, but then certainly don't ever write anything bad about somebody. So yeah. that's my, that's one of my policies. For some reason, I wrote an email to Lynette and I said, I'm thinking of having Tammy Anderson on my podcast. I saw her on a podcast and I said, She's very shy and the show wouldn't be very dynamic, but she's so interesting. And I sent it to Lynette and it is an absolute spirit thing because for some reason, as you know, it went to you. Yeah. And I was mortified and I read it and I said, well, it was honest and she must know she's not dynamic, you know, but I thought, but we need to do this show anyway. We'll keep the energy high. You wrote back and you didn't even pay attention to what I said. You were so funny. You were more flabbergasted that you were going to have interview number two, right? Yes. But the, the lesson here is that I'm going to put you in like the top five of any interview I've ever done, Tammy. The, the truths you're sharing, this the things that you shared, This is these are lessons that we all need to hear. You're, you're, you're wise beyond most of us. And, and you were meant to be on this show because I still to this day said, how did that email go to you and not Lynette, right? Because it's just a wake up call for all of us. The spirit, when something's meant to happen, it unfolds perfectly. Uh, the lesson again, be impeccable with your word, you know, and your lesson about finding that stillness and going into the fear is, you know, we were, we thought we were going to talk about mediumship, but we've talked about so many things that why is there suffering that go even beyond it? So I bow to you and you gave me my sign. <laughs> layers, layers, and layers of wonder. I found that I was laughing when I got that email. I just started laughing and part of the laughing was, it was just very funny. Um, and I almost thought, are you, I thought you were serious with the person I thought I realized a second later, oh no, this is this is not she's sending it to somebody else. But I just started cracking up laughing. I was just so funny. But also um, why did you think it was so funny? That that I was nailed, that I, you know, <laughs> no, no, no. It was um I thought it was funny that I thought you were serious at first. And I thought this is a funny way to ask somebody to do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so and so um because usually when somebody says something to me, I take it like that's what they mean, right? And so I was taking it that that's what you were actually saying, but you weren't saying it to me. But I only realized it afterwards, you know, just like a little while after I read it. But um, I was just laughing. I just thought it was so funny. But part of the laugh was I knew this was coming. I knew that we, you would do an interview. I didn't know it would be this soon. And Well, um, I got the goosebumps again was for somebody who's precognitive like you are. I guess you did. <laughs> Oh, not I was it was more sometimes, but I knew I knew and I knew it was spirit world saying, move out a little bit, you know. And they wanted my yes. And and so when I when I I wrote the reply back to you that I was gonna say yes, but then I was going and I pressed yeah. the button. 
But why you're, I think this is the lesson because you were nervous about coming on the podcast, right? Yeah, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm a quiet person. Um, I, I don't want to, one of the things I was really surprised when I went to Arts Reform College, that I had never, I never knew that there was mediums on stage. You didn't. Yeah. Um, Neither so, you nor I do that. That is not my calling and it's not yours, but yeah. Yeah. Not to say that there's some people, I mean, like there's some amazing mediums that are doing this, but for me, um, it's, it's not getting on stage. I'm not doing this to put myself, I'm doing this because I, I love the spirit world. I love that connection. And I want to go deeper and deeper into that and whatever that takes. Yeah. I'll yeah. go in that direction. And so the, in this one, the spirit world was asking for my yes. Hmm. And, uh, well, we can all see why, Tammy, you are just the most beautiful soul. And I'm thrilled that people will get to uh, experience your beautiful connection with spirit. Tammy, what's your website? Oh, My I'm website is healing, healing-wellness.com. Okay. Healing, and then there's a little dash between. But I think if you just type my name, it'll come up as well. Oh, okay. Tammy. And people can find out about readings with you there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what's the future hold for you, Miss Precognitive? <laughs> like it. <laughs> more of more of what I'm doing. You know, I'm I'm walking uh walking in a um a direction that that um that lights my soul. Well, I thank you for lighting our souls today. I have multiple goosebumps moments, goosebump moments, lots of wisdom, a lot of love. And uh I know we can all feel it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Very much. My pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. We'll see you next week. We have weekly shows now. I'm so excited. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to hit subscribe, ring the bell so you're notified anytime we have a new show. And we'll see you next time.